thank you very much for joining us and let me start this talk by introducing our today's speaker, Dr. Owen Miller, uh, work, uh, who works at SOAS, London, University of London, London, UK. It's a big pleasure to me to introduce Owen, my personal friend and colleague. Owen had received his PhD at SOAS for a pioneering work on Myon Jujon, a Choson dynasty Merkant guild which used to trade in silks, as far as I remember, if I still remember it correct, and wrote yep. several articles on how Merkants were being summoned for corvée and how accounting was taking place in that guild. Then he was further developing his scholarship, working on Marxist thought in 20th century Korea, Marxist historiography, and I, to my knowledge, his current project involves working on North Korea's industrial proletariat. North Korea is one of East Asia's oldest industrialized zones. And in fact, North Korea developed its own working class at pretty early points. There were Japanese antecedents to that. And it's a research which had been neglected in the academia for quite a long time, North Korea had been researched extensively, but not exactly from this viewpoint. There were no preceding research on the formation of industrial working class in North Korea. And that's to my understanding is what Owen now is engaged in. So today's lecture is going to deal with the theory of state capitalism, which I think is perhaps the part of Marxist understanding of history and society, which is the most relevant for our current days, given not only the prominence of explicitly bureaucratic capitalist economies like China, its imitators, and Russia and other post-Soviet states, but also $3 trillion being printed out of Sina in the United States, obviously. An example showing that capitalism is no longer <laughs> simply capitalism today, it cannot exist a single moment without the state. So it's enormously important question for our understanding of both history and our current situation. And without further ado, I would like to give uh, the word to Owen, then I, I hope you could maybe limit yourself to say about 45, 50 minutes and we recon that there are going to be lots of questions after the lecture. So the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Um, uh, and uh, I think you, you've uh, touched on some very key points that I'm going to elaborate on my talk. So I thank you for uh, making very some very uh, relevant comments. Um, and yes, indeed, we, as I will, um, I will uh, return to at the end of the talk, we live in a very interesting period in which even mainstream commentators can't fail to notice uh, that that uh, state capitalism is a, a thing. Uh, so yeah, um, thank you to Vladimir. I also like to thank the um, organizers, the SSK Global Marxism Project, um, and of course, Professor Song Jin Dong, um, who I have known for quite a long time. Thank you for inviting me and um, I sort of make a, a, a slight apology at the beginning that my preparations for this were rather rushed. Uh, I have some slides I'm gonna put up, but my slides are more by way of a kind of, um, visual um, and somewhat perhaps distracting background <laughs> to show you some some images and a few a few bullet points but I haven't uh, got a well worked out presentation and hence I did not submit uh, a presentation prior to um, my my talk today. I won't bore you with my excuses for, for that but anyway just an apology to begin with. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me pull up my um, slides. So I believe you should be able to see my uh, my PowerPoint slides. Um, let me just um, put that to full screen. Uh, 
Okay. Um, oops, I didn't mean to go do that. Right. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the reason I'm giving this talk really is that um, uh, it goes back actually 10 years to uh, uh, an event that was held, and I, I just looked this up actually at um, Gyeongsang National University with uh, Professor Professor Chong and others um, to begin a project of putting together a Is this contact? Looks like maybe contact was lost. It might have been something on Owen's side of the things. Maybe. Oh. Huh. I'll send the email. And you send email to and just check. Maybe yes. it's a problem with his internet connection at home. I don't know. It's obviously looks like ah he came back. He came back. Yeah. Good, good, good. He's coming. Oh, wait. I will open his mic. No problem. Yeah. When you can use your mic now. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm really sorry about that. I was doing the usual thing of juggling different windows on my, um, on my screen and then uh, managed to um, turn off precisely the wrong window. Okay. Let me go back to my slides and hopefully this time I can make it a bit smoother, but sorry for the false start. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to leave it there for now. Right, so as I said, the, uh, the origins of, of, uh, of this project are to put together an edited volume on state capitalism in East Asia, go back 10 years to uh, actually, in fact, May 2011. I was quite sort of shocked to realize uh, that it was almost exactly 10 years that I was um, in Jinju at um, Gyeongsang National U University to hold a workshop on this project. Um, <laughs> so it's rather appropriate in a way that exactly 10 years, or almost exactly 10 years later, uh, I'm back to talk about it again. It is also slightly embarrassing considering that uh, the book has taken 10 years to be born, and I, am, I still have to say frankly that it is not born. The book, um, this edited volume on state capitalism in East Asia is uh, complete um, in the sense that there is a complete manuscript which is now um, with the publisher. Uh, but it is not published. Um, so um, as I think probably everyone knows, sometimes the, the final birth of a book is to the part that's most painful and takes the, lo the longest um, for it to appear in the world. However, this book um, on state capitalism in East Asia will hopefully appear later this year in the Historical Materialism book series. Um, <clears throat> I say hopefully later this year, who knows, maybe it will be early uh, next year, as um, I believe they have a considerable um, backlog in their uh, publications. Um, so, uh, um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, talk then a bit about this book. I'm going to draw on the introduction to the book, which I co-wrote with uh, Gareth Dale, who I see is also here um, in our uh, meeting today. So maybe he can uh, pitch in a bit later and, um, uh, you know, clarify the bits that I, <laughs> I have not explained so well. Uh, so I'm going to draw on, on the introduction. And I'm also going to try to say something about where we are today um, in, the, in the 21st century in the middle of a global pandemic. But the, um, the insight that this book began with was that having 
been someone who had sort of learned about state capitalism theory as a way of explaining the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries in, uh, in the 1990s, I had learned about it uh, in my introduction to you know, radical politics and so on. Uh, it, something that in later years I came to realize um, could have much wider applications and particularly in the case of uh, studying the development of capitalism in East Asia. Um, and not limited to that, of course, but this was the uh, place that, of course, that I had spent time in my own research studying, and it became clear to me that state capitalism could play um, an important role. Um, <clears throat> Most importantly, then, is the fact that the countries of East Asia, um, I mean, here I'm, I'm really talking mainly about North and South Korea, China, um, Japan, Taiwan, um, these countries went underwent vast and almost incomprehensible transformations in the 20th century, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. And in those transformations into modern capitalist states, they um, the, the state itself played a crucial role in all of these countries, although in somewhat different ways. <clears throat> I should just say that my um, my cover picture on my slides here is uh, a picture that I took in Pyongyang about five years ago, uh, while we, in the bus that I was traveling in, we waited in a small traffic jam in central Pyongyang. Uh, people may recognize this is near to Changjun Street, um, one of the areas redeveloped in the last 10 or more, maybe, yeah, the last 10 years or so. Um, I think possibly just at the end of Kim Jong-il's time in power, maybe at the beginning of Kim Jong-un's, I can't remember exactly. Um, <clears throat> and you may see in my third slide here, a rather different image of uh, Pyongyang in the 1950s, in the period after the devastating Korean War, um, which had flattened much of Pyongyang. And at this time in the late 1950s, when this picture was taken by the French photographer, um, Chris Marker, well, photographer, famous filmmaker as well, of course, um, Chris Marker, uh, this, uh, when this picture was taken, the uh, city was undergoing a extremely rapid rebuilding and transformation under what I would call a kind of state capitalist sort of almost primitive accumulation process. Of course, with huge quantities of aid from uh, the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries. Anyway, that was just by way to explain my uh, my um, uh, my slide opening slide um, image. Um, so, just to say something a bit more about the scope of this book. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> The argument, I suppose, one of the fundamental arguments of this book is that um, the forms of industrial transformation, of transformation uh, into industrial societies that took place in um, East Asia in the, in the latter part, particularly in the latter part of the 20th century, had very marked similarities. And those similarities uh, went across a range of different kinds of political arrangements. Right, what we might call, say, on the one hand, capitalist um, societies; on the other hand, communist uh, societies. And also, in fact, I would say that that those similarities cross another boundary as well, back into the pre-war period uh, and imperial Japan, which again, both within its own territory and in its expansion, particularly into Korea and Manchuria, was in many ways a state capitalist um, society and entity, you might say. Um, <clears throat> so this book then argues that the great transformations of East Asian societies in the 20th century were all capitalist transformations in which the state played a leading role, or in some cases, more or less an exclusive role in capital acc accumulation. Uh, so as you can see, the book um, ha uh, has an, an extensive introduction, but beyond that, it, it 
goes um, through studies of uh, North Korean state capitalism by Kim Ha Yong, um, a chapter on Mao's China, mainly focused on the 1950s by Kim Jong Uk, um, uh, a chapter by um, Professor Jong, who is here today, um, on uh, state capitalism and the permanent war economy in South Korea. And then two further chapters are focused more on contemporary um, China, one by Tobias Ten Brink on the kind of what he calls state permeated capitalism of present day China, a very interesting attempt to actually map, you know, we, we can easily talk about China being a sort of hybrid state market capitalist um, society or political economy, but uh, Tobias Tenbrink does an excellent job of really mapping what that means on the ground in the, in uh, China's um, capitalist society today. And finally, the book ends with uh, an interesting reflective um, chapter by Mike Haynes looking at the history of capitalism and state capitalism in a very broad, much broader perspective, much beyond um, the East Asian context. So that's something about the uh, book in general. Um, <clears throat> I will go on to say something about the um, what, what we talk about in the introduction. As I said, the introduction to this book is quite extensive. Um, I think it almost reached 20,000 words, which is rather too long for an introduction, but it's, um, I'm gonna just touch on a few, um, <clears throat> a, few, a few things that we talked about in the introduction. So the, the first thing to talk about a bit is the, um, the history and the, and the fundamental concepts of state capitalism theory. What is this state capitalism theory we're talking about here? Of course, the words, um, you know, the phrase state capitalism is used um, frequently, not just by Marxists, by people in mainstream commentary as well. Um, so I'm going to try to um, set out what is particular about a Marxist state capitalism theory and what its um, origins are as well. Uh, in this relatively short talk, I'm not going to be able to go obviously into um, really great details, but uh, I will try to at least set out some of the main kind of signposts, I suppose. Um, so we obviously associate the, the, the uh, Marxist theory of state capitalism usually with attempts to understand the Soviet Union, particularly after 1928 and after Stalin's rise to power, and with uh, attempts to understand other Eastern Bloc countries, uh, whether that's Hungary or China or Yugoslavia. Uh, but the history of the concept and the whole issue of the role of state, the state in capitalism goes back much further to even to debates in the late 19th century between Marx and Engels and other socialists uh, and those socialists like La Salle who uh, advocated the idea that socialism could be achieved by the actions of the state and that the state was in some sense independent of, uh, of capitalism and capital. Um, I won't go into any more detail about that. There is some more detail in the introduction on that topic. Also, we can trace this idea of state capitalism back to uh, the sort of next generation of Marxists, I suppose, and to some of the ideas of Lenin and Bukharin before the Russian Revolution. And of course, they trace some of their ideas to um, the economist Hobson and the ideas about uh, monopoly capital or state monopoly capital and imperialism. So many of these ideas about state capitalism were, uh, were around even before the, the Russian Revolution. After the Russian Revolution, the, the sort of the true character of what this new society that was had been created or was being created, what the true character of it actually was, was a subject which was hotly debated among uh, parts of the Bolshevik movement itself. Uh, and outside, um, the, outside the Soviet Union, particularly among left communists um, who were from very early on skeptical about the Russian Revolution and its attempts to establish a socialist uh, society. And so those observers and those dissidents within the Soviet Union um, already in the 1920s began to talk of state capitalism, 
uh, but certainly by the late 20s and early 30s, state capitalism, the idea that the Soviet Union was state capitalist was already an established idea among both some dissidents within the Soviet Union and among critics outside of the Soviet Union. Uh, particularly interesting, um, there was a, a fascinating talk recently by a number of Russian scholars, including Alexei Gusev, uh, um, about the cache of do dissident documents found um, uh, in the um, isolator prison um, in the Urals, uh, which um, you know outline the deba debates among Trotskyists in. Uh, in those uh, in, in that prison under Stalin's regime. And of course, state capitalism was one of the major sort of poles in the debate uh, among left communists or um, democratic centralists and among Trotskyists as well. <clears throat> and of course, I, I mean, there's, there's quite a rich history, I think, which has yet really to be written of the history of the idea of state capitalism, particularly at this time before the Second World War. I won't go any more into that, but I will going to leap forward to the post Second World War period when um, more systematic theories of state capitalism and more systematic applications with with rich empirical studies began to be uh, published. Um, coming out of the, the Trotskyist movement. And I think coming out of the Trotskyist movement's um, um, difficulties in understanding the Soviet Union, in understanding the situation in the post, uh, post Second World War world. And also with perhaps central to this is the increasingly untenable idea, um, or Trotsky's idea that uh, the Soviet Union was still a worker state. And as that became increasingly un in untenable in the post-World War II period, um, these uh, new theories of state capitalism uh, emerged. Probably the most well-known is Tony Cliff's State Capitalism in Russia, which has been reprinted many times, was first published in 1947, or not exactly published, I believe, more sort of... Um, duplicated uh, as, as I don't know, more or less internal document. Um, also, at the same time, interestingly, um, you have uh, the Johnson Forest tendency in the US Trotskyist movement um, are centered around um, Raya Dunayevskaya and CLR James. Uh, and Dunayevskaya published an article, The Nature of the Russian Economy in late 1946. Now, it's very interesting that these two new um, uh, descriptions of the Soviet Union as state capitalism emerge at almost exactly the same time. Um, and I, I don't know enough about, again, about the intellectual history of this to understand exactly why it was, whether it's a case of influence or whether it's a case of convergence upon the same um, I, idea. I suspect it may be a, a case where there's a bit of both going on at this time. Um, the One of the key ideas of Dunayevskaya and James was that the Soviet Union could be understood as what they called a single capitalist society. Um, that is, in other words, it was a, a society with a single capitalist. The capitalist was the state. Uh, and this is really not, this, not, this is more or less the same as um, as Cliff's idea, although there are some differences between the two theories of state capitalism. Uh, interestingly, um, a third person at this time who uh, wrote a work on state capitalism was the Chinese Trotskyist Zheng Chaolin, who wrote an article called State Capitalism uh, in 1950. Uh, very obviously very soon after the um, Chinese Communist Party had finally established its power in China um, after the Chinese Civil War. Uh, not long after this, Zheng Chaolin would be thrown into prison by the CCP, uh, where he would remain imprisoned until the late 70s, uh, one of the longest serving um, political prisoners of the 20th century. He was also imprisoned earlier under the Chinese nationalists as well. But interestingly, he wrote this work in 1950, which um, was 
for a long time lost um, and was rediscovered. And I'm glad to say has been translated into English. Um, uh, the original Chinese version is available on um, the Marxist Internet Archive, but the it's now been translated into English and will be published as part of a collection of Zheng Chaolin's writings later this year, this collection that has been um, edited by Gregor Benton. And the uh, article on state capitalism has a, uh, an introduction by Walter Dahl. Um, in this article, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good and rich article and it stands up uh, well um, in, many, in many ways, actually. Um, and, and I guess we can say that it's very unlikely that Zheng Chaolin was influenced by these other uh, groups of people putting forward a state capitalism theory. It seems very unlikely to me anyway, uh, but maybe, maybe I could be proven wrong, but it seems very unlikely he would have ac had access to either Cliff or Dunayevska and James's writing. Uh, in this um, article, he argues that the that China is state capitalist uh, and that the CCP regime will continue to be state capitalist and that essentially the CCP bureaucracy is the new state capitalist ruling class, which is going to carry out the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution, which could not be achieved by the former Chinese capitalist class. Uh, essentially quite a similar argument is made by Tony Cliff later in um, his article on deflected permanent revolution as well. Um, as you can see, there's probably, as I, as I said, a kind of a whole um, intellectual history that is probably waiting to be written of state capitalism theory, but that's not what the book that I edited is about, and that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to give you some, uh, some background. Um, in subsequent years, certainly the theory came to be very associated with um, Tony Cliff's international socialist tendency and its analysis of the Soviet Union. It almost became a sort of trademark um, theory of that uh, tendency, although there were other socialist and Trotskyist or post-Trotskyist um, tendencies that also had a version of um, state capitalism, such as the Marxist humanists. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the, the theory while it was developed to some extent, was perhaps not developed uh, as far as it could have been. There were those who did do uh, interesting work uh, within the IS tendency to develop it further. People like Mike Kidron, Nigel Harris, um, Chris Harmon, and I think particularly Colin Barker, um, who did expand the theory in new directions and also also try to understand it as a much broader theory than simply one to explain the bureaucratic state capitalism of the Soviet Union and its satellites. So, um, another brief uh, interlude with a picture from Chris Marker. All these pictures by Chris Marker were taken in um, around about 1957 or 58 when he visited uh, Pyongyang. And um, they are uh, some of the most um, human and beautiful pictures of uh, North Korea, I think, which is why I like to show them to my students and why I decided to use them today to um, sort of add at least a little bit of um, interest to an otherwise rather dry um, topic that, <laughs> that I'm covering today. So to say something about the concepts of, uh, of Marxist state capitalism theory, um, there are obviously quite some quite serious differences between different Marxist theories of state capitalism that emerged uh, in the post-war years. Um, but in the introduction to the edited volume, Gareth and I tried to clarify what are the essentials of a Marxist theory of state capitalism. So I think one of the most fundamental things is that the theory holds that the state is always an integral part of the capitalist system. Capital accumulation cannot really occur without the state being there. That does not always mean that the state is absolutely directly involved in accumulation, but the state plays many functions in capitalist societies uh, in order to enable, to facilitate capital accumulation. And in some cases even takes over that uh, capital accumulation itself. Um, of course, uh, um, there, then we have 
something like a spectrum. So we are not arguing that there are two different types of capitalism. On the one hand, liberal market capitalism, and on the other hand, uh, state capital, bureaucratic state capitalism. We are not arguing that. We are arguing rather that there uh, is a spectrum of different types of uh, capitalism marked by different kinds of relationship between the state and capital. Um, <clears throat> but then we argue that all of these different types of capitalism are, uh, although they may vary quite in quite big ways in terms of the character of their economies and the character of their political regimes, um, they are all subject to the same underlying capitalist dynamic which were identified by Marx and Capital. Uh, and those dynamics are the capital-labor relation that underpins most production under capitalism and the drive for competitive accumulation that keeps capitalism in constant motion. So um, a key point uh, that's emphasized in state capitalism theory, and this has a lot in common with other, you know, with, with many Marxist theories and with Trotsky's ideas as well, a key point that's emphasized um, uh, is the international character of the capitalist system and our inability to break it down into uh, nation states or to, to use what I guess some theorists have called a kind of methodological nationalism. Thus, the capitalist system has to be understood at the same time as a in, in totality of many states, an international system, and also at the state level as well. And so thus, we argue that capitalist competitive accumulation can be driven by geopolitical rivalries, as well as by rivalry between individual capitals. Or in other words, that there are kind of um, other forms of competition that drive accumulation alongside market competition between capitals, also geopolitical competition between states. <clears throat> um, And this, of course, helps us to explain why uh, bureaucratic state capitalist regimes like the Soviet Union or like North Korea uh, were still driven to extract surplus value and accumulate capital, even without the competition between capitals within their borders or even without their state enterprises directly competing with enterprises in other countries. Well, of course, sometimes I guess Soviet enterprises did indeed compete with uh, with enterprises in in, in, in other countries. But, um, <clears throat> and it was, of course, in fact, geopolitical, the geopolitical intervention of major powers that in the first place forced the fledgling Soviet state onto the path of state capitalism at the time of the Civil War and then more decisively with Stalin's counter revolution and shift towards socialism in one country, forced industrialization, collectivization, and so on. Um, a question is raised then and has been raised a number of times before whether we should see state capitalism as a period, as a phase, whether we can periodize capitalism with state capitalism as one of the um, uh, uh, as one of the phases of, of capitalism. I think Marxists very much like to periodize, well, maybe, maybe, all, maybe all theorists and social scientists like to periodize, but, um, uh, and, and certainly in, in Zheng Chaolin's article, it's interesting that he does try to periodize and he does try to say that, you know, after, uh, you know, merchant capitalism, industrial capitalism, financial capitalism, then the next phase of capitalism is state capitalism. That's what he's seeing from his vantage point at the exact midway of the 20th century in 1950. I think, however, uh, in our approach to state capitalism, I would like to avoid that kind of periodization. Um, I would rather say that state and capital are deeply intertwined or inter interrelated in capitalist society at all times, at all points and different places in the history of capitalism. And that uh, the, 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 the different types of societies that we see under uh, the capitalist mode of production are the outcomes of differing arrangements of the relationship between the state and capital, <clears throat> among other things. Uh, and I think probably, uh, you know, Zheng Chaolin's idea that state capitalism might be the sort of last stage of 
capitalism after Lenin's last stage of uh, capitalism um, perhaps has been shown historically not to really work. Um, um, well, who knows? We may be entering a new state capitalist age, but that's a matter for perhaps for debate. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, another thing I wanted to talk about fairly briefly is um, the, the theory of state capitalism and the, the question of catch-up development, which is particularly um, relevant to uh, East Asia and the East Asian context. And this is a key theme of many of the chapters in the book on um, state capitalism and East Asian development, obviously. Um, and in this, of course, state capitalism comes up um, directly against another um, much more mainstream, much more popular and well-known theory, which is uh, developmental developmental state theory, which has, I guess, been the sort of almost uh, hegemonic theory within um, sort of mainstream analyses of catch-up development, and particularly of East Asian countries like uh, Japan, um, South Korea, and and even and more recently um, China as well. <clears throat> Now, I don't have a slide for this. I'm afraid I have to admit I ran out of time here. So I will show you another one of the pictures um, by Chris Marker, which uh, again shows the reconstruction of Pyongyang in the, um, in the late 1950s. Um, so I think um, the important point here is that state capitalism can be useful for us in understanding Understanding the late developing countries of the 20th century in which the state played such a central role in the establishment and development of capitalism, not just in East Asia, but everywhere from India to Egypt, Israel, Turkey, and I could probably go on listing for some time, but I'll, I'll stop there, um, as well as places like China, South Korea, um, Japan. Um, <clears throat> a number of the uh, chapters in this edited volume make the argument that the developmental state theory is deficient as an understanding of the actual development of these uh, late developing or catch up industrialization countries uh, and state capitalism can instead provide some important insights. I think particularly the chapter by um, Lee Jong Gu, which uh, is about the um, theory of uh, uh, the developmental state um, theory and China is very interesting in, in this regard. Um, so developmental state theory was originally developed to explain Japan's post-war takeoff. Um, uh, I think, I mean, Thomas Johnson was one of the most well-known sort of advocates of this kind of approach. Uh, and it was then very much, very, um, uh, much applied to South Korean development, I think beginning in the 1980s with Alice Amsden, um, then Meredith Wu and so on. And in a sense, I mean, then, it, then it, as I said, later came to be applied to China as well. In a sense, DST or developmental state theory almost came to be advocated as a sort of model or a template among uh, some, uh, some scholars and policymakers and so on. A template for development in other countries. We, actually, we can still see this in a sort of strange way with the, with the way that the South Korean state operates in trying to export aspects of its developmental model to, um, this is, I mean, an echo. I mean, I'm not saying that they are necessarily exporting developmental state theory, but there are sort of elements there of them trying to export this to um, uh, the global South. Um, <clears throat> One of the most uh, problematic aspects of developmental state theory that's directly challenged by state capitalism theory is the idea of state autonomy. Um, so effectively in state, you know, with state capitalism, sorry, with developmental state theorists, there is the idea that there is a group of enlightened bureaucrats who can guide the economic development of a country while suppressing the influence of individual capitals um, the influence of geopolitics and so on in order to sort of create a safe uh, environment for the, the sort of uh, or the development of a, um, a post-colonial, usually post-colonial country. Um, and this has led to a tendency in developmental state theory to overlook international factors and to concentrate instead on kind of national institutions that facilitated catch up and take off. <clears throat> 
Some other uh, key factors tend to be overlooked in developmental state theory, including in, in their explanations of development, including the role of class uh, is very much overlooked. Um, and the role of state violence in creating the conditions for capital accumulation, especially in creating the conditions for the kind of original or primitive accumulation. Now, of course, these kind of criticisms of, of developmental state theory are not, are not limited to people who advocate state capitalism. You know, many people make these, or a number of people, number of different kind of um, tendencies will make these, uh, um, these criticisms of, uh, of developmental state theory, uh, including, you know, many Marxists have done in the past. Um, I think state capitalism theory allows us to integrate this kind of critique and to offer an alternative. Um, another problem that I think state capitalism theory overcomes is the adherence of developmental state theory to a kind of two worlds framework of the Cold War period in which the world is very clearly divided uh, into two camps, a capitalist camp and a communist camp. But developmental state theory doesn't give us much, you know, doesn't have much to say about the development of countries within the um, within the so-called communist camp, i.e., well, we could talk about North Korea, we could talk about Vietnam and so on. Um, and it pays little attention to trying to explain this difference. It just takes it as an a priori kind of fact of life that there are two, uh, two camps. And generally speaking, developmental state theory does not try to uh, explain explain what this fundamental political economic difference is, or to try to understand the way in which the so-called communist and capitalist blocs were interlinked with one another. Um, state capitalism theory, on the other hand, sets its sights beyond simply explaining these so-called successful cases of Asian development to understanding the capitalist and so-called communist countries of East Asia as parts of the same global capitalist system, all shaped and driven by the same logics of capital accumulation, military competition, and class conflict. Okay, the final thing I'm gonna talk about, I think I'm sort of running, beginning to run out of time. Um, I obviously have slightly shot myself in the foot here because I managed to, um, lose about five minutes, but anyway, um, perhaps Vladimir, if you will indulge me to spend about five to 10 minutes. No problem, no problem, feel free. I, I guess that our Zoom link is not going to expire. So we, okay, good. We're in a very good position now. I don't want to test everyone's uh, patience anyway. Okay, I'm just gonna finish by saying something about, um, uh, uh, about, the situation today. I'm not going to provide any wonderful, well-developed insights about what is actually going on in the contemporary capitalist world. I'm just going to make more, make some observations and perhaps think about how uh, state capitalism theory can be a helpful way for us to, you know, move ahead in the kind of analysis that we do need to do of the contemporary world. So what is the significance of state capitalism theory at the, um, beginning of the third decade of the 21st century. So it seems to us that the, um, the era of bureaucratic state capitalism and the era of catch-up development seems to be behind us. I mean, we, we can say that the, the last significant bureaucratic state capitalist uh, societies you know, ended in the, in the early late 80s and early 1990s. And we don't see significant examples really of you know, large scale catch up industrialization going on either. Uh, of course, we can argue that there are still some bureaucratic state capitalist societies, although that's, uh, that's a, a moot point as well. But um, <clears throat> we instead seem to be entering a new period of imperialist rivalry, um, mainly between uh, the United States and um, China. <clears throat> uh, which is not really uh, exactly, although people like to talk about the new Cold War, I don't think it's exactly comparable to the Cold War. We don't see 
the um, uh, inter-imperialist uh, rivalry as yet being expressed on such a clear sort of ideological level as it was in the Cold War, albeit that some on both sides of this inter-imperialist inter rivalry are trying to revive that kind of ideological um, warfare. Anyway, that's somewhat beside the point. Um, <clears throat> So we certainly do live in a world where there are many very significant economies which have complex hybrid forms of state and market capitalism, um, and China being perhaps only the most obvious example, but I think there are, there are many others. Um, <clears throat> but I think we could also, you know, perhaps look at post-Soviet Russia as well as another example. And as uh, you know, as my own um, current research interest is in North Korea, I find the contemporary um, political economy of North Korea both baffling and also fascinating from the point of view of um, state capitalism. Uh, in, in fact, I would say that North Korea is a state where neither bureaucratic state capitalism nor market free market capitalism exist exactly, but we have a kind of very, um, I don't know whether unique is the right word, but quite unusual um, combination of the state and private interests in, 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 a, in a new form in North Korea, which is of course still evolving. Um, and there's another very important phenomenon in contemporary capitalism, which is the increasing role of the state in the supposedly or what we usually call neoliberal economies of the big um, Western um, capitalist states. And this was particularly remarked on in the mainstream at the time of the great financial crisis beginning in 2007, um, which according to a number of mainstream commentators led to the rise of a new state capitalism. Um, so, for example, in 2012, The Economist magazine published a dossier, a special dossier, on, which was entitled The Rise of State Capitalism. And I will quote um, a, uh, a quote, I'll take a quotation from that dossier. Um, <clears throat> so bear in mind, this is this is a mainstream, you know, liberal uh, um, analysis of of the world as they see it, and not, not a state capitalist theory analysis. But anyway, it's interesting to understand how mainstream um, you know, economists and so on are, are seeing this. They argued that the current crisis of liberal capitalism has been rendered more serious by the rise of a potent alternative, state capitalism. State capitalism is on the march, overflowing with cash and emboldened by the crisis in the West. State cap companies make up 80% of the value of the stock market in China, 62% in Russia, and 38% in Brazil. Uh, add the exploits of sovereign wealth funds to the ledger, and it begins to look as if liberal capitalism is in wholesale retreat. State capitalism increasingly looks like the coming trend. Now, of course, whether or not that, you know, was actually a good prediction of what happened since <clears throat> um, 2012 is, is another matter. I don't think that we have said goodbye to neoliberal forms of capitalism in the European and American countries, but we have seen new kinds of, um, how should we say, sort of new kinds of, <clears throat> well, I don't want to use the word hybrid again, but we have seen new kinds of economies emerge in which, in some cases, the state is playing a large role, uh, <clears throat> and in which, but in which also austerity and classic neoliberal tools have been used to a great extent as well. Uh, now, of course, we are living through a pandemic um, in which states in the advanced uh, or economies are spending absolutely vast sums of money in order to keep capitalism running. Uh, in many cases, states have effectively uh, nationalized much of the economy on a temporary basis uh, and are paying a huge proportion of workers' salaries from state funds. So effectively, what we have had over the last 14 months is perhaps what would have been called in the past war capitalism. It is a type of state capitalism. It appears to be temporary, 
Um, although, you know, whether or not it will just sort of suddenly disappear in a few months' time, um, I think we, you know, that that seems unlikely to me. It's going to have some lasting effects, even if the major states of the West, you know, of Europe and America want to get back to sort of you know, business as usual quickly, um, it seems unlikely that it will not leave its mark. Uh, to give a sense of the scale of this, I think Vladimir mentioned this at the beginning, I was looking up some of the figures before my talk today, and um, apparently the US state has made $4.2 trillion uh, available for COVID spending. One website I looked at um, actually claimed that the state support offered by the US in various different forms, including tax breaks and so on, could amount to 13 trillion. Now, I, I don't know, this seems outlandish and it may be exaggerating for its own political reasons, but certainly um, even 4 trillion is, is, a, is an absolutely um, vast amount. In the UK, state borrowing has uh, reached 355 billion in the 2020-21 um, um, financial year. I don't know what the, the situation is in, in South Korea or perhaps Vladimir, you know, in Norway as well, but um, this is not uh, limited to, to one or two countries. This is a global phenomenon. Effectively, the largest economies in the world and actually some of the smaller ones as well have switched into war capitalism mode for 14 months demonstrating to us very, very clearly that the state is always part of capitalism, is always an essential part of capitalism. And in a sense, there isn't effectively a, a capitalism and a state capitalism. Capitalism is always state capitalism in some sense or other. <clears throat> um, I think for Marxists, one of the important insights of state capitalism theory is that these interventions by the states are not aberrations uh, from some true kind of abstracted form of capitalism. Of course, Marx wrote Capital and he did describe an abstracted form of, of, of capitalism there, but that is not the capitalism that we experience in real life. It was obviously part of Marx's method to uh, produce an ab abstracted form of um, capitalism. Um, the state is uh, part and parcel of how capitalism works. And ne neither, and this is another important point I think needs to be made, neither does state spending or even direct state control of parts of the economy mean something called socialism. Socialism, of course, to Marxists means something wholly different, a wholly different way of organizing human society in which the means of production are directly controlled by the producers themselves. Uh, I will finish there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. It was extremely interesting, very thought provoking. And thank you very much for correcting me. I think I have Maybe that was the last package amounted to three trillions, but if you took together, if you take together the whole spending during the whole pandemic period, the figure is absolutely astronomical, more than four trillions, which would be three times Russia's GNP for, uh, for a year. So it's an absolutely fantastic figure. So thank I think you some of much. it is projected. I think some of that is actually projected, but still, I mean, you know, I, I, these things always end up being larger than even the, the biggest projections, usually. So. Yes, yes uh, I, I guess that Gareth Dale would like to see the final slides. Maybe you could show them? Yes. The final slides? Yes. Oh, yes, and... I put a couple of extra pictures on the end. Just right. uh, mm -hmm. um, as I said, my, my slides are mainly there by way of distraction and entertainment um, than anything else. <laughs> This slide shows the uh, the infamous Volvos of Pyongyang, which are a symbol to me of, of uh, North Korea's attempt to internationalize its economy in the 1970s, which failed miserably. Uh, and uh, symbolically, they bought 1,000 Volvos, which um, the North Korean state was never able to pay for because of the problems of the oil crisis and so on. Um, and uh, apparently, they still haunt the streets of, um, uh, of, of Pyongyang. Uh, the final image is one final image from Chris Marker's fabulous collection of, of photographs of North Korea. Um, he had a way of capturing the, the humanity of uh, a developing, you know, rapidly developing 
um, economy, you know, underneath the heroic or the gargantuan sort of mechanical <laughs> um, uh, world of, of, a, of an industrializing capitalist economy, you find there are human beings, of course, and Chris Marker had a way to capture them, which you cannot really find in North Korean representations uh, for perhaps obvious reasons, I guess. Um, anyway, that's that's why I put this, this picture. Thank you very much for those pictures. I have never seen them before, so it was a revelation for me. I didn't know that this French photojournalist visited Pyongyang, and it's very good that now we have seen the pictures, probably would be able to find them. So thank you very much. It was extremely interesting, very, very thought-provoking. And now the floor is open for questions, suggestions, and general deep so may I suggest that we proceed in the following uh, way. Those who would like to ask questions, I myself have lots of them, but I would reserve it to the end. And those who would like to ask the questions, may I suggest that you do one of two things. Either you use the raise your hand sign on your Zoom icons, and then I, as, as soon as I see your icon with the raised hand, then would like to give you the floor. Or please write down your question in the chat using the chat function, and then I can read it aloud to Owen. So I guess by combining those two methods, we can proceed in an orderly fashion. So the floor is open now for questions, suggestions, comments. Who would like to be the first? I can be the first, but I, I guess that there are people impatiently waiting for an opportunity to ask a question. So. Let's see. I don't see any raised hands so far. Uh, so far, cannot see any questions in chat, but they are probably coming. Okay, so that we give the people an opportunity to think over their questions. I'm sure there would be many. So maybe I should ask my question first. I have several ones, but let's begin with this one. So thank you very much. It was very thought-provoking, really. What I has been thinking about, if you look at Korean capitalism's long-term trajectory, it started with small-scale industrial enterprises in the last pre-colonial decade, first banks and so on, and now we have neoliberal South Korea and what you characterized as a sort of hybrid Pyongyang regime. And what is interesting is that state capitalism is always, has always been there and is is there at every stage of Korea's capitalist development. The first banks in pre-colonial Korea, like Chonil and Han, were all established with heavy participation from the imperial house. That is the state, state's visible hand was there. Industrial enterprises were in the beginning established by the merchants or aristocrats or merchants who were protected by aristocrats at it all in the end those networks centered at the imperial household. Imperial household was actually the biggest investor in the country. So even pre-colonial capitalism was very much of a state capitalism kind. And then you had Japanese capitalism, which actually Co Korean Marxists in the 1920s, 1930s, now I'm researching on Lee Yosong wrote this book, Sucha Cho Son Yonggu. Uh, it's a Marxist research on Korea's colonial economy from early 1930s. He characterized Sotokofu's capitalism, state capitalism, Sotokofu, mm. was an enormously wealthy investor with lots of land, lots of uh, capital invested into de facto state-owned banks and so on. So you obviously had patterns of state capitalism then. And then you had two independent of dependent careers, each of which was developing its own pattern of state development. So the question is, the state, the state is here in neoliberal South Korea as well. It's very visible, especially in the time of pandemic. So the question is, all this having been said, then what is the special thing about the party state constructed in North Korea? It's obvious that the tendency towards state-led industrial development is a general feature of say 20, 21st century, Korean economy at large. But when it comes to party states still, we had the patterns of extremely fierce political rivalry. Still North Korean party state is being 
would say disliked very strongly <laughs> by established elites, not only in South Korea, but generally uh, throughout the world. So to say it became a global focus for lots of hatred. So maybe there was something special about this party state regime, which while this regime generally belongs to the type of state-led development, uh, say, uh, developmental regimes, may, may, if we could somehow characterize what is particular about it, not what is general about it, I would say the state-led Industrial development is a very general thing in the 20th century. I would suggest that if there is a particularity in such regimes, their real particularity probably lies in the realm of both political and economical in the nexus between policy, politics and economy. And I would characterize it as their ability to completely change the elite really bring completely new people who had never been given an opportunity to stand at, on the top, and enormous ability to extract not only surplus, but much more than surplus, ex to mobilize the, state, the resources to the degree which ensures their ability to proceed with social engineering on an almost unheard of state scale, for good and bad. <laughs> social engineering has many faces. And not necessarily all, all of them are positive, but anyway. So I, I, I would say that there's probably this mobilizational capacity and this capacity to engineer a completely new elite without actually that much connection to the pre-revolution, uh, the original one. I, I don't know what, I, I just wonder what you think about it. And after that, we already got the first questions. But let's begin with this one. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so just to, first of all, to take up the point you made about pre-colonial capitalism in on the Korean, you know, in Korea, uh, I guess in the Taehan Empire period and so on. That's a very interesting um, topic. I actually wrote a um, book chapter for the Routledge Handbook of Modern Korean History, in which I talked about this quite a bit. Not based on my own research, I hasten to add, but based on uh, my uh, gathering of, of secondary materials from some fantastic South Korean scholars. But um, yes, absolutely, it, you know, the, all, all the efforts really were more or less focused around state um, interventions of one kind or another and patronage of one kind or another. And um, <clears throat> Of course, the big difference to later attempts at state capitalism in Korea is that they were a failure. I mean, by and large, they were <laughs> a great uh, failure for all kinds of reasons, probably a lot to do with access to, to capital and also to do with geopolitical conditions, which meant that the, 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 the Tehan state was in a very much weakened, declining position. Anyway, it's certainly very interesting. Um, and of course, if they if they had been able to, I'm sure they would have. Uh, well, it seems that likely that in the early 20th century they would have embarked on a kind of imitation of the Meiji um, period uh, transformation, but they were not able to. On your question about the particularity, yes, I mean this is a fascinating thing. I think I would like to relate what you say about the the party state ruling class in North Korea, and I'm sure we could find other, you know, relatively similar places in the world as well. Um, but what you say about it, I think I'd like to relate to some of the observations. I mean, for example, the observations made by Tony Cliff in his work on what he called rather awkwardly deflected permanent revolution. Uh, and this idea, and also I think Zheng Chaolin touches on some of the same ideas. This idea that uh, in the conditions where um, the sort of uh, existing ruling class in colonial or post-colonial countries is often so deeply kind of um, intertwined and embedded with the imperial or former imperial um, uh, regimes, then um, and and in other ways kind of corrupted or, or you know playing the role of, I guess, what was often called comprador capital, then uh, another other layers in society come up to take the place of the bourgeoisie, often, you know, in the form of perhaps military officers or in the form of, you know, layers of kind of um, maybe sort of technically minded um, 
a petty bourgeoisie who quite often then carry out quite major purges of the previously existing ruling class, replacing it and then trying, attempting to ruthlessly impose their forms of discipline, not just on the, the working class, but also on the sort of former or, you know, bourgeoisie and so on. And so ov obviously in, um, in North Korea, you have a very extreme example of that with the aid of the Soviet army, the um, you know, the new North Korean party state and, and its bureaucracy were able to just completely replace any previously existing uh, ruling class who would have been by and large the collaborators of the Japanese imperial um, regime. Uh, but also you see Park Chung-hee attempting to do something similar in the early 1960s in South Korea as well and to sort of um, either replace or um, completely subordinate the existing um, bourgeoisie in, 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 in South Korea. I mean, in the end, I don't know whether you could say he was entirely successful or not, but he did manage to subordinate the um, existing business uh, owners to his own um, agenda and his plan and plans of his, uh, of his um, economic planners. But yes, I mean, I, I think the particularity of somewhere like North Korea is perhaps the, the extreme to degree to which this happened. And, and as you say, the kind of unprecedented scale of, of, of mobilization of, of all kind of social forces. And, um, you know, there are, there are sort of, I guess, particular geopolitical conditions on the, around the Korean peninsula, which have helped to facilitate that sort of very... Um, extreme form of party state, perhaps. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can help much. I can say much more about that. Um, I think there are some questions in the, oh, there yes. are quite a few questions. <laughs> yes, yes, I guess that I can read now. The first one was Son Mia Sansenim, and she has asked three questions. So I'm going to read it one after another. The first one is here. If we can call the state capitalism as Russian economy, then we may ignore the effort of Russian revolutionaries who put the effort to revolutionize Russia. So I guess that it, uh, it's supposed to be about the particularities of post-revolutionary state. Well, state capitalism existed in Russia since Sergei Vita's reforms. So to say, I think Russian capitalism always was state-led state to some degree, but what was the particular thing about post-revolutionary variety? which you characterized as state capitalism. Mm. That was the first question. Then second question by Son Mia Sansanim was, we may differentiate the capitalism in the non-revolutionized countries such as South Asian countries from the, or and the countries which, has, which have attempted revolution like China, Cuba, and Russia. Is it possible to differentiate between those non-revolutionary or post and post-revolutionary? societies. I think it actually in a way it falls up on the question which I has asked. So mm. then what is special mm. about post-revolutionary party state society? Mm. So mm. and then the third question, the last one, what does war capitalism mean uh, in, in the relationship to COVID-19 pandemic? I heard that there are several debates about the COVID-19 results, whether the pandemic is going to result in an economic crisis or not. So uh, the, the last question is a request to uh, elaborate on the meaning of this term war capitalism. So here we are. Okay, so uh, in answer to, thank you for your questions, Mia Son. Um, uh, in answer to the question about, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to satisfactorily answer these, all these questions, but I will try. In answer to the question about um, Russia and so on, I mean, I would, and, and also I think I'll try to answer the second question more or less at the same time. I mean, I would like, first of all, to make a distinction between uh, Russia and the Russian Revolution on the one hand, and then the revolutions that happened in China and Cuba um, somewhat later, because I think there is a difference of category here, difference of type, in that the Russian Revolution most certainly was, according to the historical record and everything we know about it, uh, an attempt at a proletarian revolution and an attempt at uh, trend, you know, a social revolution transforming a society from a capitalist society to a socialist one. I don't personally agree that the Chinese or Cuban revolutions were the same thing. 
Um, and I think I agree with Zheng Lin that effectively the Chinese revolution was a kind of bourgeois democratic uh, revolution led by the Communist Party. Um, I don't know exactly how I would characterize the Cuban revolution, but again, I would say it's a form of political revolution. Um, so that's first of all, I would say that. Second of all, I would say that I don't think we should ignore or diminish the um, effort of the Russian revolutionaries to carry out a proletarian revolution and to, to introduce the first socialist society. I don't think we should ignore or diminish that effort. But I think there was a counter-revolution in, in the Soviet Union in the late 1920s. And I think that counter-revolution did not just come from sort of how that Stalin was a nasty person or something like that, but it came from the geopolitical and general conditions in which uh, the Soviet Union, the very young Soviet Union found itself and in which ultimately it, any hopes of a socialist rep transformation were snuffed out um, quite early on. Exactly where you place the end of those hopes is a matter of debate among many different Marxists, I think, but um, that's uh, certainly um, what I would argue there. Um, can we differentiate then, you know, between, say, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of capitalism that exists in China, Ru Cuba, Russia? Well, I think, yes, I mean, you know, historically, of course, the historical sort of origins and the processes by which a country industrialized and became established as a capitalist country, a center of capital accumulation, those historical processes are going to have an effect on the kind of, um, a kind of society that it is now. Right. And, you know, I mean, I'm just going to bring up one thing here, which I think is particularly interesting. And I think um, that need, more work needs to be done on this in analyzing some of the bureaucratic state capitalist countries and more generally is the question of like of the, what we might call the social wage or what we might call welfare um, and the way in which the bureaucratic state capitalist countries um, used um welfare and and you know um often at times increase the size of the um or of the social wage it's not something that i think has been analyzed um very clearly you know because we might look at somewhere like north korea or china and say that well you know in the industrialization process people were paid extremely badly you know industrialization as in other parts of the world was carried out by suppressing workers consumption workers wages as it was in south korea but we need to also look at the social wage we need to also look at what other kinds of um uh, uh material benefits were being offered to workers in the process of industrialization by by the state that's one area where i think it would be interesting to look at it but we can also find this of course in many um what we would think of as conventionally capitalist economies um, Norway, of course, which um, Vladimir knows very well, is a country which has always had an extremely large social wage, as I understand it, in the sense that workers have gained benefits well beyond their salaries um, through the redistribution by the state. <clears throat> anyway, I'll stop there because I'm starting to wander off into other areas. I think the third question about war capitalism. Well, what I mean in introducing this term is there's a reference to the kind of way that, uh, you know, say the British economy was run during the Second World War, but many other uh, capitalist economies. Um, and I suppose one of the key features of, well, the key features of war capitalism are that the state um, takes a much more direct hand in the economy. It nationalizes many industries or temporarily takes them over or directs them from private capitalist interests. Um, and in many, many other ways, it becomes much more directly involved in the economy. I guess the interesting thing about war capitalism, as opposed to other types of state capitalism, is that it's generally understood as temporary because it exists while a war is going on. And I guess if we can say that we are having a war against a um, unseen virus at the moment, then we can say that perhaps we're in a period of temporary um, uh, war capitalism in the same sort of way. I'm not sure, as with all analogies, I'm not sure whether the analogy is a perfect one. There may be many problems, but I think it's it's quite a useful one to think about things. As for how things will happen after um, this period of war capitalism, I, I really um, obviously don't know. But uh, certainly after the Second World War, Trotskyists predicted that uh, there would be a huge global crisis, which might spell, spell the end of capitalism. 
and they turned out to be wrong, although the economy took some years to recover from the Second World War. By the early to mid 1950s, we were in the one of the greatest boom periods that capitalism has ever known. So I don't want to predict. <laughs> But, you know. Yeah, with the war capitalism, you obviously have this analogy now in Australia. They introduced the system of exit permits, exit visas, basically, <laughs> which, well, I'm very well acquainted with this system because Russia used to have it for a very long time. But obviously, in Britain, the only precedent would be the wartime situation mm -hmm. when exit permits existed in Britain as well. So mm -hmm. that's quite obvious analogy here. Okay, and then Professor Chon Son Jin has two questions, which I'm going to read now. Oh, and thank you very much for the great talk. Thank you very much also for revisiting long overdue book project on the state capitalism in East Asia, started in Chinji Korea 10 years ago. Your discussion of the state capitalism in the 21st century is highly informative and useful for our current research on post-capitalism and the innovation of Marxism. I have two questions. First, what is your explanation of the disintegration of the USSI in 1991? Is it the moving sideways from the state capitalism to the private multinational capitalism, as was argued by Chris common, or is it the change within the fundamental is the same state capitalist formation? That was the first question. Second question, is the concept of state capitalism applicable to the Western advanced countries as well, not just Russia, China, North Korea, and so on? If so, if the state is the integral to capitalism, if the state capitalism is not a particular phase of capitalist history, and if capitalism is always state capitalism, what will be the analytical or political utility of employing the concept of state capitalism, apart from capitalism in general? That is, if all kinds of capitalism are in the end somehow state engineered. As for example, now Chomsky has been saying for quite a while. So then maybe it's enough just to say capitalism on the understanding that it's always to some degree state capitalism. So those are two questions. And if I'm allowed to add the discussion about the continuity between USSR and the current Russian regime is very lively one in Russian mm -hmm. Marxist circles uh, <clears throat> as well. And the questions are quite interesting and serious here. The questions are both, uh, really important also for understanding of current situation. So I'm looking forward to your answer. Okay, my, my brief answer to the first question from Professor Jong is, is, is yes, I would see it as a moving sideways and I would agree with, um, with, with Chris Harmon. Um, it was another kind of uh, political revolution that happened um, within the same kind of fundamental mode of production or same kind of um, social system. Um, I, I have to plead my ignorance on the current uh, state of the, um, uh, the Russian economy, although I did quote at the end of my talk that um, figure which was quoted from The Economist saying that the, um, where is, where is it? saying that the, um, uh, that 62% of the stock market in, in Russia, this was written in 2012, is, uh, belongs to uh, is the shares of state-owned uh, enterprises. Now, I mean, clearly, um, the, the Russia appears to be a much more state-oriented capitalist economy than, say, the United States. Um, where it falls on the spectrum, I don't exactly no, I can't exactly say. It's no longer a bureaucratic state capitalist uh, economy or what Dunayevska and James would have called a single capitalist society. It's no longer that, for sure. We know that. But um, where it is exactly, um, uh, I, I can't say. But I still I do think that using the term state capitalism in relation to Russia today would, would still be appropriate, probably, um, in some senses. Second question is, yeah, it's, it, this is a this is a tricky kind of problem of, of concepts and, and naming and categories and so on. And I do sort of and I do really kind of agree that in a sense we we should talk about capitalism in general. In a sense, um, you know, ironically, the point of state capitalism theory is to say that there isn't really an absolutely separate thing called state capitalism. The point of it is to break down this idea of, of a duality of there being two different types of two fundamentally different types of economy and society that existed in the um, 20th century. Um, however, I think there is still a utility in naming 
those societies in which the state plays a much greater role as state capitalism, because it helps us, points us towards some of their features, which explain how they operate and explain their character. So it helps us pointing towards certain features that help us to explain catch up development and industrialization, um, you know, and so on. And, you know, I think in that sense, it has, it does have um, a utility. Uh, um, it, it also, I think it helps to, in a sense, it's one of the things it does is to sort of expand upon and fill up, fill in gaps that existed in Marx's own work on understanding capitalism. Because of course, Marx's work was done at a particular time and place, because he was always abstracting a, a, an ideal form of capitalism for the purposes of analysis, and because his work was not complete as well. So we, we know that we need to introduce new kinds of concepts or sort of um, certain levels of theory which help us to uh, fill out and expand upon uh, Marx's conception of capitalism. And I think state capitalism is one of those useful concepts. Thank you very that. much yeah. for the answers. If I am allowed to add on the first question, well, in Russia today, actually the distinction between state-owned and private, large private enterprises is probably meaningless because in reality, the latter being more or less directed by the former and often appear as the agents of the former. So to that degree, we, have, we can talk about state capitalism. Certainly the thing is that if you look at the social wage in Russia today, it looks like it's smaller than in most Scandinavian countries. So the redistributional part is gone, but the state directing in a way the state controlling the surplus, it's still there. So the state does control the surplus, but doesn't seem to wish to redistribute it any further. It has its own ideas how to use it, I guess. So, uh, and then we have Gareth Dale, I guess that Gareth is going to ask his question directly, please. Yes, the floor is yours. Hello, um, thanks for the fascinating introduction, Owen. Um, I, um, and this is, a, just to say, this is a wonderful series of talks that you've laid on, um, Professor Jong and your um, fellow organizers. Um, I, I just, it's not a question, just a comment really. I, I, I think that, one of the ways of addressing some of the questions that have been asked is to remind ourselves that the argument Owen is making is being made on two levels of abstraction when we think about state capitalism. Um, in one sense, um, in a sort of universal level, we're, we're looking at the commonalities or we're looking at the way in which as capitalism develops, actually all elements of the social system um, become integrated into a uh, into uh, cap along capitalist lines, uh, operating according to capitalist principles and so on. Not in a totalitarian way, there are all forms of resistance uh, all over, but merchants uh, become transformed into capitalists and a pre-capitalist state becomes transformed into a capitalist state, which is integrated with the capitalist ruling class. And so at that fundamental level, all capitalism is in a sense, state capitalism, state is a capitalist state integrated into the, into the mode of production. But Owen's argument is also operating at a, uh, a different level of abstraction where we look at different regimes of accumulation around the world and, it, and it actually at different phases of history. So, um, so in certain phases of uh, world economic history, there were, or world history, there were uh, factors conducive to um, highly etatist forms of uh, um, accumulation, such as we saw in um, the Soviet Union and East Germany, but also uh, in many other countries in the world, I Iraq, Peru, and so on. And what are those factors there? High levels of geopolitical competition, particularly arms races, their catch-up develop, high intensity catch-up development where the state seizes society in their attempt to um, establish conditions for sort of take off industrialization so as to be one of the colonizers rather than the colonized. They are, um, uh, what else? Um, uh, sorry, mine's gone blank, but there's, there's a series of factors that we cover in the chapter uh, that, that Owen mentioned um, that, that led to that 
phase being um, highly etatist around the world, war economies in the West and so on. But, and then, uh, and then also one can look at certain forms um, being particularly state capitalist in particular ways, the bureaucratic state capitalism argument. And this helps us understand why the United States and the Soviet Union, for example, were in their economic system more likely to clash. It wasn't simply a question of geopolitical tensions, but there were systemic elements as well. If the Soviet Union had won a war against the, the, the United States, it would quite likely have nationalized the uh, property of American capitalists. If, American cap if, American, if America had won a war against the Soviet Union, it would have quite likely privatized um, and stripped out the ownership structures that the Soviet uh, ruling class had at its command. And so, the, so, so I think uh, if we look at it at those diff different levels, it helps us understand some of the questions that have been asked. Mm. Okay, Owen, so would you like to respond to, I think it was more comment, I guess, since the question, would you like to offer any response? Yeah, just briefly on, uh, I mean, thank you, Gareth, um, as, as, I, as I thought and hoped you'd come along to help and clarify some of the, the points. Um, it's very handy giving a talk and then having your collaborator there as well to, um, you know. Um, but, but yeah, one, one point I suppose I'd like to make is that yes, um, as Gareth was arguing, and uh, it's not that, um, uh, that, that that state capitalism doesn't have a sort of historical aspect to it. Of course, it does. Uh, but that uh, what I wanted to the point I wanted to make in the in the talk in a very simplified way was to say that we are not arguing that there is a, a particular phase of capitalist development called state capitalism. Right? We don't see it as a, as a matter of periodization. But of course, at particular points in the history of capitalism, um, the role of the state has been greater or lesser. And particularly, you know, this is why we're particularly paying attention to you know, catch up development. And actually, not just in the 20th century, but we could take that back going back to the, um, the 19th century as well. Perhaps that, perhaps that rolls into the, the next question quite well about non-capitalist production. Yes. Yes. So maybe we can then roll over to the next question. So what is your conception from Paul Zaremka? What's your conception of the accumulation of capital as a concept? So Marx's own summary at the beginning of the general law of capitalist accumulation says that it's increased in the proletariat, more workers, not necessarily more capitalists. I think Marx actually thought the capitalists would be fewer in the end due to the general monopolization of production. How does penetration of non-capitalist production, or you will probably argue that it was state bureaucratic uh, mode of production, how does it fit into your overall theory? Uh, Paul writes that he, he himself rejects that accumulation of capital would mean more means of production or industrialization. Mm. So can I just clarify, thank you for the question, can I just clarify that non-capitalist production, you mean the way in which uh, capitalism penetrates into the realms, the existing pre-existing realms of non-capitalist production, such as, I don't know, peasant farming or that kind of yes. thing? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. I mean, I can say something about my own uh, research, which Vladimir mentioned at the beginning of the, um, in, in his introduction, um, that I'm currently working on North Korea in the 1950s and um, the process of industrialization there. And of course, one of the most marked features of that process of industrialization was a massive increase in the working class in a very short space of time. I can't remember exactly the figures that I managed to put together, but it's something like between one and two million people flowing into the major industrial cities in the period between 1953 and about 1959 or something like that. So in a, in a relatively small country, you have a very, very rapid and an extensive um, uh, creation of a, of a working class. Um, and that's obviously absolutely necessary for uh, industrialization. And one of the main ways in which um, the new economic system penetrates into the, I guess you could say, um, 
not exactly pre-capitalist, but the existing kinds of production relations going on in the countryside is through collectivization. And this again is done very rapidly. It's being done at the same time in China and North Korea, interestingly. Uh, but between 1954 and 1958, there was a uh, more or less complete in, well, no, there was a complete uh, collectivization of the um, agricultural system in North Korea, which helped to drive very large numbers of peasants into the cities. And it also dispossessed effectively the peasants of their ownership of their land and means of production, um, which ironically had been given to them in 1946 by the uh, reforms under the Soviet uh, military um, government in North Korea. So you have what some people have described in the case of China as well, I think, as a kind of original or primitive accumulation going on uh, in a very rapid way in uh, 1950s North Korea um, through the process of collectivization. I'm certainly not the first person at all to observe, observe that process of collectivization could be a form of um, uh, could be a form of primitive accumulation and establishing the basis for uh, industrialization and an expanded working class. I don't know whether that, I mean, I'm just trying to use an example that to hopefully um, answer your question. Thank well, you very much. Yeah, but the, I mean, no, you didn't answer the question, uh, I don't think. So I just wanted to know, in your slide six, you referred to accumulation of capital. You mentioned uh, competitive accumulation of capital. Okay, so basically, I was asking the question: What does it mean? What what is what what is in your mind about what accumulation of capital means? Well, I mean, in a sense, what the what the North Koreans were doing in the nineteen fifties was almost uh, sort of. It, exact replica in miniature of what Stalin wanted to do in the 1930s. It was a case of we have to catch up, we have to compete with our rival, or we die, basically. That was, um, and that is what's driving the process of very rapid industrialization. Um, and that is what's driving the process of proletarianization. Uh, that's what's driving the process of complete complete economic change, both in the urban environment and the agricultural environment. Yes. Well, I guess that, that that was the explanation on what accumulation could mean in the particular context of the 1950s in North Korea. So I wonder if there are any more questions. Anybody else would like to ask any questions or offer comments, thoughts, suggestions, commentary? Well, obviously not, none for now. So I myself have lots of questions and thoughts, but we certainly can share it privately afterwards. And since we are a bit behind our time, I think now, well, organizers know it better than me. I understand that originally it was supposed to be one hour or something <laughs> event, and now we are a bit behind our schedule. So, and as, it looks as if the questions now has been exhausted more or less. Thank you very much. Thank, thank every, uh, I would like to thank everybody for coming and special thanks go to Owen for having delivered an extremely interesting thought provoking talk. Uh, and say, I would like to thank the organizers just for putting everything together and for having this lecture uh, serious at the first place. So thank you very much. And I hope that we are, we are going to have good attendance at our following lectures in those series. Thank you, Owen. And I hope to see you. you. Hope to see you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks and for if, I wonder if, Ogana, if the organizers would like to say something in the end.